Latch the windows, lock the doors, and put the kids to bed. It's time for another episode of Tales from the Garage. Okay, this is how you know I'm back in the garage filming. I just made a video, uh, recorded, it was almost 30 minutes long, and it didn't come out. Um, when I pressed stop record, I got the infamous blank screen that basically told me nothing recorded. Now, I always, because this computer's been acting like this in the past, I've always done a test recording, so before I start filming my videos, I film for a couple minutes and check to make sure that video came out. And this thing is like playing games with me, because those, whenever I film those, they always come out, and then I'll film the full video as intended, and you know, get into some 20, 30 minute thing, and when I press end record, all of a sudden, instead of the thumbnail coming up properly showing me, you know, showing the, the start of my video, I see this blank screen and I shudder. And I often get discouraged and it, in a lot of cases the video never gets made a second time or it takes weeks to get back to it. And I just decided, you know, I'm going to give it one more shot tonight. And, um, you know, it's weird now I have to go over and speak about all the stuff that I've already spoken about. So I'm doing my last video on duo albums, the last one where I'm showing vinyl, uh, after this it's going to be exclusively CDs. Uh, in the last few weeks I keep coming across um, duo albums that I've kind of forgotten about on CD as I'm kind of perusing my collection. And as each day passes I keep on finding more and more duo albums on CDs. And my intent is not to show everything I have that's a duo album, but just favorites. But I have more than I thought I did, especially in some cases by some artists I kind of forgotten about because I may only have one CD by them or two CDs by them, and one of them happens to be a really good duo project. So I tend to forget about them. And I was perusing my collection and I see, oh wait, that's a really great album and it happens to be a duo album. And this keeps coming up. So I got quite a lot of material. Uh, to do favorite duo albums by. Uh, if something else interesting comes up that I can think of to do a video on, I'm certainly going to do that. Um, so my intent is not to just keep on going with these duo videos until I run out of things to show. But um, for lack of anything else to really speak about or show, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this again. Now, by the way, the albums are all out of, completely out of order that I showed them in the first video. And I did have them arranged for a very specific uh, reason. I'm going to start off with uh, these aren't all these aren't all ECMs this time. I'm going to start off with one that I've spoken a lot about and I've showed a lot through the course of the years, even recently, kind of from 1986, kind of a new, I guess you'd call it like an elect electric electronic new age, and that's Latitude. Uh, a two-man band. They've made subsequent albums. This is their first album that has no title. It's called Latitude uh, from 1986. And I remember the day. This is one of those albums that I have a very specific memory of buying in the store. Um, going to the shop that day, flipping through albums, taking a look at it. Uh, I didn't know either of the musicians involved but the instrumentation looked interesting. Uh, it's a guitarist, Ben Verdery, who plays a lot of acoustic guitar, and when he plays electric guitar, it, it's almost always in a very clean fashion, not kind of like a distorted fusion-y thing. And um, Craig Payton, who is a very well-known vibraphone player, who also plays the Fairlight 3 uh, keyboard. The interesting thing is that his vibraphone uh, and he was pretty much I guess, one of the first guys to do this, is not just the standard vibraphone, but, and I guess this is even pre-MIDI, uh, he has and still uses his vibraphone to this day. Uh, this electronic attachment that's attached to the vibraphone that essentially takes the sound of the vibraphone and alters it uh, like a synthesizer. So it's essentially like a synthesizer that's attached to the vibraphone. And he gets many different tones and sounds out of it than the standard traditional vibraphone. Very interesting. Even to this day, I love the sounds he gets out of it. And he's still active and playing in the New York City area. Um, currently, he has a band that he gigs with. And um, there's videos on YouTube of him playing. And if you look closely, you can still see that little attachment that he's got on the vibraphone, which is his, his 
synthesizer processing thing, which is very cool. He was so far ahead of the game in this. I know um, Mike Minieri, the vibraphone player, the jazz vibraphone player in New York, at one point had even contacted him, and he had worked with Mike Minieri, uh, even. So Craig Payton was definitely ahead of the game. This album was recorded in 1986. I think it's the best Latitude album because it's the quietest. Uh, it's not a, a real fusion-y thing. Um, it's the first album that I ever heard uh, realistic drum samples on. So now I'm, I'm in the store by looking at this album. I didn't really know Craig Payton, but I'm looking at the lineup. Okay, so it's got a guitarist, and it's got a vibraphone player who plays keyboards. So I'm thinking this is going to be you know, a very, very mellow album. There's no rhythm section. There's no bass and drums. And I get home, and I put it on. And I hear bass and drums. I hear like electric bass and drums as well. And it wasn't the electronic kind of, at the time you had some very early electronic drums that Tangerine Dream were using, or even uh, like Kraftwerk on Autobahn. But it had a very synthetic sound and you knew that these were electronic, you know, like electronic gadgets, not drums. In this case, I heard what sounded like very much like a, a real drum sound, which obviously, it took me years to figure this out, must have been some very, very early samples of real acoustic drums. Now, the thing I like about this is that they could have made this whole album really sound like a full band and really brought the rhythm section up since he had these incredible sounding drum samples and these electric bass samples too that are there. Um, so they really could have made it kind of sound like a four piece band. Um, but instead, m m pretty much most of the tracks that use this quote unquote rhythm section of bass and drums, the rhythm section tends to be kind of mixed back, which I like very much. It very much features Ben Verdery's guitars and Craig Payton's vibraphones and keyboards. And where the rhythm section is there, it, it, it's in the background, it's very subtle. And on, on future albums, you know, they stuck together as a duo, but um, they kind of brought the rhythm section up. So that if you were just playing the music, kind of figured out it was probably a four-piece band. I hear bass and drums. So to me, they weren't trying to necessarily make it sound as full and busy as possible. The rhythm section was there kind of in a supportive aspect um, to highlight the music. And the music was quite a bit mellower than the subsequent albums they did. Um, and I love it. It's, 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 just a, it's just a favorite to this day. Now you listen to it now, and I don't think, you know, it, it, even whether or not you know these are samples or not, it, it doesn't sound unusual or new, but to me the music holds up, and it's just a, just a really nice 40-something minute album, and just uh, tons of atmosphere and vibe to it, which I love. Here's a big one in my collection. Uh, Ambient 2 by um, Harold Budd and Brian Eno. Uh, 1980. Now I bought this as a new release, so it came out either late 80 or early 1981. Excellent album. I highly recommend it. Uh, 1984, they did a follow-up called The Pearl, which is just the two of them. That's the only other album they made together as a duo. For me, I far prefer this one to The Pearl. Um, very, very pretty music. Nothing avant-garde, really, or experimental. Um, when this came out, Brian Eno didn't have a lot of solo albums out. He had three vocal albums that were basically, you know, pop vocal albums. Uh, I had two of them I don't like. They're not really my thing. Um, and you know, one of them had a, a, a couple uh, instrumental tracks here and there, which are very interesting. Um, but my real interest in Brian Eno's work was he had just kind of created this whole ambient music idea concept with his first ambient music album, which is called Discreet Music. So initially he had this... Uh, this concept of music, and he called it discrete music before he adopted the name ambient music. And to me, discrete music is probably the best ambient music album um, ever. And it tends to get undercredited because at that time, Eno hadn't yet come up with the term ambient music. And when he decided he liked that term better, he started using uh, the term ambient music and then created ambient music number one. My records are slipping here. Hold on a second. Uh, he created ambient music number one, which is music for airports. And so because because of the numbering system, I think people tended to forget about discrete music, which to me was the best ambient music album he ever did. 
These damn records keep slipping, so I'm gonna have to do something here. There's always something screwing up my videos. Um, so, um, I had discrete music. I had music for Airports 1, and I pr pretty much bought music for Airport 1, I remember when that came out. So, I was already a convert, and that was it for, for solo albums. You had three vocal solo albums, two instrumental solo albums, and this was the third, and then his collaborations with Robert Fripp. That was the only Eno that was out there. Now there's, uh, I think, too many Eno albums. Um, and uh, But this is one of the best. Now, I had no idea who Harold Budd was. I bought this because it was part of the Ambient series, so I kind of knew the music, uh, the direction of the music. Uh, I knew Eno, so I picked it up, and this is my first Harold Budd album, and it was the one that turned me on to Harold Budd, and Harold Budd is one of my favorite composers in the world now. Uh, and this is where it all started. Now, r roughly, uh, you know, I, I can't do videos anymore where I spend three or four weeks gathering information for the videos. If I were to do that, I would never make another video. And a lot of my earlier videos were done that way, where I was gathering so much information, and then I was conveying maybe 70% of it. So everything I'm doing here is off the cuff now. So some of this information may be slightly off. Um, so I, I get this album, and I love this album. And I realize, being fairly familiar with Brian Eno, that really most of this album is more, much more Harold Budd than Eno. Uh, Harold Budd plays acoustic and electric pianos on this album. And Eno plays a little bit of synthesizer, but mostly, it seems, what he does is process what Harold Budd plays. So really, most of these compositions are creations, essentially, of Harold Budd, with some interjecting from Brian Eno. And that's fairly apparent when you hear the album. And this being, and I love this album right off the bat, so it's like, okay, I gotta go look for more Harold Budd. Now, at the time, I don't know where the Pavilion of Dreams falls into the, uh, the time frame here. So Harold Budd had only one album, one solo album in print at the time called The Pavilion of Dreams. It may have come out after this, but I don't think so. I think it came out a little bit before this album. Because I remember buying this album, loving it so much, that I went to go look for Harold Budd, and the only other thing that was available from Harold Budd, uh, the only solo album he had out at the time, was The Pavilion of Dreams. So I think that predated this by a little bit. I know the compositions on The Pavilion of Dreams go back much earlier, go back to like the, the 1970s. Um, but The Pavilion of Dreams was an album that Brian Eno was involved in. Not sure if he produced it, um, but he had his hand in because Brian Eno had heard Harold Budd's music and was very impressed by it and wanted to, you know, thought there should be an album of, of Harold Budd's music out there. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if, if Brian Eno was actually the main producer of Pavilion of Dreams, but it was, uh, he doesn't play on it. Um, but it was basically an album of various compositions that Harold Budd had written over the years for different ensembles, uh, different sized uh, groups and groupings of musicians. It's not a set band or group or number of musicians that appears on each track. And so right after getting this and digging it and, th and realizing that the, you know, the main musical guy on this album is Harold Budd, not Brian Eno, um, I... Uh, Went and bought The Pavilion of Dreams, which is a life-changing album. It's an incredible album. Still to this day, even though it's very early in Harold Budd's career, I think it's a standout, one of the best things he ever did. Extremely atmospheric music. Very interesting album. Every track has a different musical setup. Uh, there's a couple tracks that are just harp and voice, and then there's ensemble things. It's 90% acoustic. There's a little bit of electric piano on one track on Pavilion of Dreams, and that's it. Everything else is marimbas and uh, acoustic piano, and it's an incredible album. But this was the start of me being a major, major, major Harold Budd fan, uh, easily one of my favorite composers. And this is a great album in and of itself. But make no mistake, 90% of this album is Harold Budd. Um, a fantastic album to this day. I want to give uh, some honorable mentions. It just uh, to to somebody uh, a couple really good. Egberto Gismonti, the Brazilian guitarist pianist. 
Um, he's recorded a ton of albums. In vari- you know, he's done solo albums, group albums, but he's done a handful um, duo albums with Nana Vasconcelos, the percussionist who passed away not that long ago. Um, and these are a couple of them, and I just had to mention them uh, because they're so special and they're just really, what a great combination. Um, what can I say about what I like? I, it just dawned on me a couple days ago. I think of um, Egberto Gismonti, very similar to, to, to Ralph Towner. Now, Ralph Towner is an American musician. He plays acoustic guitars, uh, not electric guitars. He plays acoustic and classical guitars. And he's a very good pianist as well. And Ralph Towner's an American guy and influenced by American jazz. Uh, but also influenced by classical music, I think European classical music, but also modern kind of American or just modern classical music. And to me, Egberto Gismonti is like the Brazilian version of him. He's also a guy that plays guitars. He plays steel string guitars and nylon string guitars, but he doesn't play electric. Like Ralph Towner, he's an excellent, excellent piano player. He's dabbled a slight bit like Ralph Towner in synthesizers and keyboard synthesizers. Um, but, and he's a multi-instrument mentalist in addition to the keyboards and guitars. He plays, he plays some flutes, wood flutes and that kind of thing. Um, and Ralph Tanner is another guy like that. I guess the difference is Egberto Gismonti's music goes back to the, 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 all the way to the ethnic beginnings, I think, of Brazilian music. And I don't mean like the 50s kind of uh, popular jazz Brazilian music, but I mean the acoustic uh, you know, music that predates electric instruments. Um, so there's a lot of difference in terms of how these two guys compose and present their music. But I think if you really love Ralph Towner, I think you would at least very much appreciate Egberto Gismonti, because they're, to me they're both fantastic. And it just dawned on me that they're really kind of like brothers in a way. Um, and Egberto's recorded a lot of great albums. When he does a solo album, that's just him by himself, you know, that's my favorite thing, you know. But um, his longtime partner, Nana Vasconcelos, and him played together many for decades and made a whole bunch of recordings over the years. And there's just a couple of them, a few, that are just duo albums with the two of them. But you can't go wrong. Um, just like Egberto Gismonti has this kind of unique perspective on choosing instruments, uh, the thing I like about Nana Vasconcelos and all the percussionists like Tree Like Gertu that I like and Colin Walcott is that they're all different uh, in terms of there's so many when you get out of the, the drum kit mindset and you're a hand percussionist and you play percussion instruments, there's so many to choose from. To me, it's always interesting uh, to note when I discover a new percussionist or I'm getting into a new percussionist that they all seem to gravitate toward certain instruments. It's kind of like somebody told them they had to make a stew, but they could use literally uh, every ingredient available in the world. And they're not going to use them all, and they're not going to use the same ones. It's always interesting, well, what ingredients are you going to choose? And eventually, they tend to use a lot of the same ingredients, and that becomes their signature style. So I, I guess for a lot of people that don't study hand percussionists, they tend to think of congas and bongos, which I don't. You know, To me, that's the least interesting when it comes to, um, to, to hand percussion, you know, the, the, the various unique instruments like uh, Nana Vasconcelos is very much a user of the barambao, which is this kind of bizarre one-stringed instrument that you play rhythmically and just you know the various shakers and the instruments that they choose to use versus the ones you choose not to use. Uh, George Jinda, the late percussionist who worked in a very commercial band, Special Effects, even though he was playing a very commercialized music, still had a very interesting selection of instruments that he used in his percussion arsenal and he almost never played congas and bongos he was playing udu drums and different types of shakers and and things like that so so it's and Trilok Gertu who uses a lot of tabla but he also uses a lot of other percussion instruments um, it, it's just so interesting to see what these guys choose as their colors and of course it all affects the music too because the the instrumentation is what makes a lot of these records really you know or one of the elements that makes uh, you know, their recordings unique to other you know if you slotted in a different percussionist there it would sound completely different whereas 
if your percussionist was a kit drummer and you replace them with another kit drummer, there might potentially not be a whole lot of difference between what you get as an end result musically. When you're dealing with hand percussionists, because they all gravitate toward different instruments, you never know how it's going to come out, and that really affects the sound stage in the music. Um, I, did men I did mention in my previous video, which didn't come out, that, that there's a few albums here I'm not going to bother to show because I think that they'll, they'll come up eventually uh, in, in other videos. I want to pretty much wind this up in terms of showing my uh, vinyl because there's um, there's uh, a lot of CDs, as it turns out, that I discovered that I love as duo albums. So here's one of Carm's favorites and a, a kind of unique album. Gary Burton and Steve Swallow, um, Hotel Hello. Um, recorded in 1974. This is an ECM recording. Um, I, you know, Gary Burton and Steve Swallow played together for ages. Steve Swallow was Gary's bass guitarist in all the um, versions of his band for, 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 I don't know, for 15, 20 years, maybe more. Um, but they only did this one duo album together. They currently have not played together for years unfortunately. And I would love to see them get together and do another duo album. And they only did this one, uh, sadly. And because um, I, I asked Steve Swallow, whose partner is Carla Bly, now they live together uh, in upstate New York, but I think in recent years they spent most of their time in Europe, uh, living in Europe. So I don't know to what extent they are in the United States anymore. So I think there's a logistical thing too. And because Gary and Steve haven't been playing together for years, I don't know if we'll ever see them do another, do, certainly do another duo album together because Gary, as far as I know, re remains in the United States. Um, and this is fairly unique because I like the instrumentation. There's no drums or percussion whatsoever. Steve Swallow plays his bass guitar. He also plays piano. And um, Gary Burton plays uh, vibraphone and marimba and also organ. And I love that combination of instruments. I love organ with vibraphone and marimba and bass and piano. Just that combination of instruments together. Um, most of the compos there's a couple cover compositions. And uh, Gary Burton was always very big on recording tracks from the composer Mike Gibbs. So there's a Mike Gibbs track here. There's a Carla Blay track here, which is no big surprise because Gary Burton's recorded a lot of Carla Blay tunes, including a full album of just Carla Blay songs. And most of the other compositions are by Steve Swallow, who does write a lot more. Um, recorded in May 1974. I. It's a unique album. At times it has a very 60s-ish sound. I think there's certain rhythms and a certain style of, of playing the electric bass in particular that Steve Swallow has that's a lot rooted in the late 60s sound. Now, of course, at the time this recorded, the, you know, the 60s were only over for four years. So, um, you know, it's not like now. If, if something were to sound like the 60s, that would be something because that's quite a long time ago. So it's got a bit of a 60s vibe to it. Um, and I think my only criticism of this album, which I love very much, it, it's uh, Steve Swallow's tunes are not all that easy to get into. In a lot of cases, they're very complex and have unusual chord changes. So they're not always something that you could just put on and mix company and it would work as background music because it's going to sound a little strange. And that's part of his charm. So it's one that really requires listening. And I think you don't necessarily get it, you know, the first time you, you hear it. You really have to kind of pay attention and, and, and give it a chance. Um, my only criticism of the album is the recorded sound quality is not really that great. And I noticed that when I played it. Now, at the time I picked this up, I had been an ECM fanatic for a while. And ECM, at that time in the 70s, certainly, and also going into the 80s, most of the ECM albums were recorded in one of two studios, um, and they were all done by the same two engineers. Uh, one is in Ludwigsburg, and the other one was Oslo, Norway. And each one of those studios um, had a recording engineer that ECM used pretty much to record, I don't know, 95% of their albums. Um, 
And so they had a really good, really excellent sounding records with clarity and depth and things that you didn't get even on other jazz recordings. And when I played this at first, I didn't particularly pay attention to the studio. And I noticed it didn't really have that clarity and depth of sound. And I took a look and I uh, discovered that it was recorded in a, a recording studio in Massachusetts by a different recording engineer. They didn't they'd probably use a studio recording engineer. They didn't fly in one of those two uh, ECM engineers that were uh, the recording engineers for the typical ECM studios in Europe. Um, and my feeling was that either the studio technically wasn't up to the quality of the European studios that ECM typically use, or the recording engineer at that point may have been more familiar with recording rock bands and didn't really know how to record things with more depth. You know, now there's electric instruments, you know, there's electric piano on here and electric bass and organ, but there's also, you know, the vibraphone and the marimba and the acoustic piano. And none of them have a real great depth to them. So I'm slightly disappointed by the sound quality. And I realized at the time, I, I know Gary Burton has been a, a teacher in Berkeley in Boston for a lot of years. I don't know if he was at this point already in 1974. I think maybe he was, which could have been why he didn't fly out uh, to Europe to use the ECM studios in uh, either Ludwigsburg or Oslo, Norway. Um, but I'm a little disappointed in the sound of this. I wish this could have been recorded in one of the ECM studios. Still a very fine album. And the last one I'm going to show, um, and God knows if this, if this is even going to come out, is this is a classic, one of my favorite albums of all time. Art Landy, the pianist. Jan Garbrook, the saxophone player, who also plays flute on here. Red Lanta. Uh, all, this, is, this is a classic, very inspirational album to a lot of musicians, as I learned later on, uh, recorded in November 1973. Um, all the compositions are by Art Landy, so there's not, a, typical, typically ECM recordings would have uh, at least, you know, a couple tracks that were fully improvised by whatever musicians were involved, but this one didn't have that. And you could kind of tell in a way, these compositions seem to be pretty much worked out. They're all credited to Art Landy. So it's very much an Art Landy album where, I guess, um, Jan Garbrick was asked to come down and uh, you know play saxophones and flutes on them. This is probably my very favorite flute work that I've ever heard from Jan Garbrick on here. And this album is a little bit different from any other um, Art Landy or Jan Garbrick album. It's kind of unique in their in their catalog of recordings. Obviously, probably more closer to some of the things Art Landy's done, but um, pretty awesome, pretty unique, pretty unique stuff. Very beautiful, very classical sounding. If somebody told me that these were compositions done, uh, written, composed by various classical composers, I could believe it. Um, does it really doesn't sound like it doesn't sound like the kind of mainstream jazz like you would think uh, like a bebop um, based musician would record. Um, very European sounding. Um, and like I said, if somebody told me that these were compositions done by various classical musicians that just happened to be played by Art Landy and Jan Garbrick, I could believe it. Excellent, excellent album. Pretty stuff, easy to get into. Like I said, um, probably the best flute playing I've ever heard by Jan Garbrick ever. And this album is fairly unique in my collection. You know, I had done a um, video where I talked about musically cleansing your palate, you know, when you spend a lot of time, you know, days or weeks or however long uh, listening to a, um, a favorite artist's albums or a certain genre of music where you're just listening to like say acoustic jazz or fusion or um, you know, whatever, one musician's works, or electronic music or something like that. And after a while, it's like, oh, I'm burnt out on this. I gotta like wipe my slate clean. And for me, whenever I do my palate cleansing, when I'm kind of burnt out on the stuff I've been listening to, and I wanna wipe the slate clean, I always go to classical music, uh, and, and mostly orchestral, symphonic music. Um, and to me, that kind of like just calms everything down and it, it, 
you know, there's, there's just a lot to listen to in symphonic classical music, but it's also a lot more low key than, you know, listening to 20 minute drum solos or saxophone solos or something like that. And, um, and I pretty much stick with modern classical, established classical, mainstream classical music. But Redland is one of, is just really the only non-classical album that gets in there, in that mix. This will be played in that mix with classical albums when I need to do my palate cleansing because it's got such, it's got such an atmosphere and vibe to it. Uh, imagine uh, maybe like Debussy or, or Satie's um, solo piano music at its mellowest, maybe, you know, with an added flute or, or saxophone player, you know, kind of like in that area. Um, and it slots in and it fits in well there and it's really the only non-traditional classical music album that gets into that playlist when I need to do my, my palate cleansing because it, it, it so speaks to that vibe. It's not really like listening to like a jazz album or even a, a new age album. It kind of slots into that classical vibe and I love it and um, a, great, a great album and I had to show that mainly because it's also a duo album, and so it fits in with the, uh, the theme. Okay, so now I've gone on for over 30 minutes. The last one didn't record. I don't know if this one's going to, but if you're watching it, that means it did. So anybody that's been watching, thanks for watching, and uh, I'll be back soon. Take care. Tune in next time for more Tales from the Garage.